And here we go. We're going to rebuild the nation after the Civil War. We are finally in period 6, 1850 to 1890, and we are at Unit 15. After the Civil War is over, a lot of people decide that they're not going to stay on the East Coast. Um, and a lot of those guys that were fighting in the Civil War, remember, were Irish immigrants. Uh, some Germans, but a lot of Irish. You also had freedmen. So, and they weren't welcome in a lot of places anymore in the South. So these people different groups of people very diverse are all going to head west so a lot of this unit is going to be about living in the west so it all starts really with what we call the homestead act and it was done in 1862 so you should know what president issued this should i wait I know it just popped right in your head, right? It was, of course, Abraham Lincoln. So part of the Homestead Act um, gave people a chance to have 160 acres of land for $10. And in return for that, you had to promise to do certain things. You had to build a house on it. And that house had to have a window, which we will come back to in a minute. But make sure you know it had to have a window. They had to live in that house for five years. So it has to be a place you can actually live. And they had to improve the land within those five years that means they had to make money so I'm gonna let you watch a film now um, about the Homestead Act and what kind of people took the president up on that offer and how it changed the face of people who were living in the West and yes sorry but you do need to take notes okay so let's watch the video and then we'll come back to this slide All right, so how do you decide who gets what portion of land? Suppose you have a portion that's got a stream going through it and, and 20 people want that. Well, sometimes the way that they did it was bribery, of course. Maybe you'd pay more than the $10, but other times they had land race claims. And basically, um, on, a, on a given day, a spe specified day, all these people showed up and they lined up at the starting line and somebody blew a whistle or shot a gun and when that happened everybody raced to the land with a flag and if you planted your flag in a plot that you wanted before anybody else did it was yours now the plots were already roped off or identified in some way and so you just had to get your flag there first so again i'm gonna let you watch a film um it's it's a pretty famous film called far and away and you're gonna see a land race and some of the crazy ways that try, people tried to get ahead of others and some of the accidents that happen so again let's take a minute and i'll let you watch that film and then we'll come back and talk about the sod busters So you heard on the film a lot of different nationalities. So who were the sob busters? It was all those people that you heard from all over Europe. Um, some were, were local people as well. Um, but sod busters, the reason they got that name is because they were the first ones to break the sod in the West. And the sod there was, was called that because it wasn't just called dirt. It was called sod because it's special. It is joined um, together with the roots of the grass. And it, if you don't have a plow you're not going to break through it just there's no way so the sod busters are, are people who went out west with a plow and plowed the land for the very first time so sod busters basically just means that they busted up the sod for the first time now many of these people um, wanted, needed to build a house very very quickly and so you get something called a soddy and a soddy, C-O-S-O-D-D-I-E, a soddy is a house made of sod, which is what you have here in front of you. My husband and I went to, I believe this was Nebraska, and we got to see a sod house museum. And this is an actual sod house that um, wasn't originally there. They picked it up piece by piece and moved it, but it is an original sod house. And so you can see there's not a lot of wood in it. Um, and so it came together really, really cheaply and without a lot of fuss and must. Don't even need nails for this. 
So this is the inside of the sod house and notice it is going to be a dirt floor. Almost everybody just had a dirt floor. You would have a wood stove. It actually stayed pretty warm in there. Um, they created this this plaster st type of stuff out of lime and mud and mixed a little paint in it to make it white. Um, lime is white too. The lime was for bugs to keep bugs and spiders out. Um, so it actually wasn't too terrible as far as cleanliness but you made the house very very quickly and there wasn't a lot of ventilation again we'll get back to the windows in a minute but there wasn't a lot of ventilation and so people started uh, getting sick with diseases such as cholera and typhoid because of the close quarters the distance from um, being able to get to medical care and not having a lot of airflow in these places um, but it was warm um, so there was good and there was bad to it now this is what they used to heat put in the oven they also used the corn cobs there that you see if they didn't need them in the outhouse then they would put them in the oven so right there you see um, the corn cobs were their toilet paper but these cobs were saved for the fireplace so you got lots of corn cobs from there were corn crops everywhere so you just kind of split it between using it as heat and using it as toilet paper in the outhouse yeehaw I did a close-up shot of the roof because I wanted you to see that even the roof was made of sod. They would have thrown the boards up there um, to give it strength, but then to keep the cold out and to keep the heat out too, to keep you know what coolness they could in the building, they would just put sod right on top of it. And so grasses grew on and on top of the house. And you see here that um, kind of prickly stuff is growing on top of it as well. Now the birdhouse, um, most people to, were allowed to take one thing that they really, really loved with them when they traveled out west. Remember there's going to be very limited storage space so they had to be careful to select just one memento that meant a lot to them and women very often selected birds was the fat of the day so a lot of pictures that you see from the sodbuster times you'll see birdhouses hanging from the outside of you know the little the little doorway there will be birds so you could hear them singing whether you were inside or outside so let's get back to the window part of the homestead act in many areas not in all of them but in many of them said you can't really have a house without a window well windows are very very expensive so if you notice how this window is made it looks really super easy to pop out like if you just pushed on it it would pop out of its frame that's exactly how it was made so many neighbors would get together and some of them are not super close they're miles apart but you knew what day the government people were going to come and check on on your little plot to see if you were fulfilling the demands you know to keep your land and so you knew what day this person was going to come visit so you knew what day to have the window in and then when they visited your land and they were going off to somebody else you would send a rider to the next person and get them to you know ride ahead of the inspector and get that window in the next house before the inspector got there so th this window could go into many many different houses and then when the window wasn't there of course you had this big gaping hole that you had to put something over but it was a way to cut down the cost people didn't have money for glass and so it was it was difficult for every house to have a window and so they shared them very often there's lots of pictures out of this time period. Um, this one was actually inside the museum that I told you about. So it's called the Nebraska Gothic um, 1870 and you can see how it looks all cluttered. You know what what the heck is going on? Why do they look so messy? It's because they you didn't get a picture very often and so this is kind of their way of bragging. So they would have brought things out of the house or maybe out of the barn or put things closer to put them in the picture to kind of brag like look at what we have and do notice the birdhouse in the background so this wife obviously chose a bird like many other women to bring it to her new home in the west and here again you have a giant window so this family was probably pretty well off or they had you know a scheme with some pretty well off neighbors and notice this one has two bird houses so they are probably pretty well off because of the two birds and the two windows 
All right, so we know all the different types of people that were moving out west as far as immigrants, especially the Irish. Don't forget you have a lot of the, the Irish going too. But we also have African Americans, and 1879 is their key time that um, things have settled down enough, and um, you, you got that uh, compromise of 1877 where the military zones were removed, and things are getting really bad for blacks in the south, and so by 79, you have this huge wave of african-american families moving out to kansas to get their to get their homestead act acres and so these guys become known as exodusters so exodusters are black individuals who moved to kansas the problem is that they were on the tail end of this homestead act and kansas was basically the only place that had plots left that you could get under the homestead act and 40,000 of them are going to go together and there's not a lot of good land left so farming for an exoduster is going to be really really hard but but here you know what what are your alternatives there was a group that uh, did a program called back to africa and you could get on a boat for free and you could go back to you could go to liberia in africa if you didn't want to be in america anymore but who wants to go to liberia these people are not Africans they're Americans they most of these people had no idea anything about Africa unless the stories have been handed down through their family so why would they go to Liberia less than a hundred people ever got on that boat and went to Liberia so a lot of these people will turn to a new life in the West and they'll become exodusters so you have a rough really rough life if you stay at home as a sharecropper but you have a rough life too to be an exoduster so there's not a lot of opportunity for black families during this time period after the Civil War. Let's look at all the alternate alternatives for African American men. So we've talked about the exodusters and, and in essence that is a very dry farming, really hard to do. We've talked about sharecropping where you're, you don't own the property, you're lent, you're leasing it th through a crop lien from a white guy who's probably going to rip you off and there's no way for you to better your family circumstance. There were some African American men, way more than we think of, that made up the group we now know as cowboys. Now cowboys didn't last very long, but a lot of them were African American men that will do um, uh, cattle uh, ride the cattle to the cattle stations for the train so they could be cowboys a lot of them were buffalo soldiers and the buffalo soldiers were hired from hired by the railroads to protect the uh, railroads against Indians and so they will um, make pretty decent money I mean there's still racism of course this is right after the Civil War but to be a buffalo soldier um, you could actually make make some money so these guys again after after the civil war these are men that that wanted to stay in the military and so they're going to have a hard time convincing people to let them until they come up with this job to you know use the buffalo soldiers to protect the white people on the railroad against indians um black men could go north but you're not going to have a lot of jobs there was a lot of resistance to allowing blacks into the textile industries or really any other jobs other than demeaning ones in the north and again you could choose to go to liberia but nobody's really going to want to do that what about women didn't women have to move out west or want to move out west? Sure they did. So women of the 1870s are going to have a very different experience in the west. Many western states allowed women the right to vote simply because they didn't have a large population and they needed voters. So it's not legal in the United States at all, but some states did allow it. Some states also allowed equal pay for women, especially if they were teachers. So a male teacher and a female teacher out west would make the same amount of pay. That is unheard of in the east completely unheard of uh, women also had the right to own land so this maria rita valdez operated um, a very large um, community i guess you could say where she owned it all and that name of that community was rancho rodeo and today we know it as rodeo drive get it hollywood rodeo drive like super built bazillionaires live there lots of females were writers and their writings were actually read it, um it was just an adventure and exciting to find out that you're you can read something from a female that moved out west even men thought that was that was exciting uh lots of ladies turned to performances too so annie oakley uh, 
um, an expert sharpshooter, that kind of stuff, uh, women definitely were welcome into those kind of shows. Now, they're probably not going to get paid as much as men, but they are allowed to be in the shows and be performers. And I think Annie Oakley is probably one of the most famous, if not the famous. Now, not all women will find a better life because women are more, um, more susceptible to harm in the West. Um, Women, sometimes when Indians and whites clashed, the women were not killed outright. They were taken in and made part of the tribe against their will sometimes sometimes they wanted it but very seldom and this young lady here that you see at the bottom of the page is an example um she and her family were attacked by a group of indians i don't really know that the circumstances behind it but um, her parents were killed by the the group of Indians and four of her siblings and then I know she had a younger brother by the name of Lorenzo and Lorenzo was like 10 or 11 when this happened she was 14 and I can't remember her name but it's not important I just want you to kind of get an idea of what could happen so Lorenzo uh, was scalped and thrown over a cliff and left for dead he does not die, but um, they leave him there because they think he's dead. So they take this young lady here in front of you and her sister, uh, last surviving sister, into the tribe. The sister gets older or gets sick. The older sister gets sick and she ends up dying. But this young lady, um, we don't know if she was cooperating because she was afraid for her life or what the deal was, but she really like officially made herself part of the tribe so much so that they tattooed her as they did all the women in the tribe and so you see the the streams running down her chin is actually tattoos and they are also on her chest and on her back now a few years later i think it's five or six years she runs away and she does escape Uh, she gets away and she is somehow reunited with lorenzo who was thrown off the cliff so i don't know how they found each other but the whole point of the story is that women were susceptible to uh kidnapping and you know bad things happening to them out in the west but it didn't have to be a bad experience women could actually find a quality in the west so there's good and there's bad so moving out west in general you're going to have lots and lots of immigrants and you do need to know that the majority of them were from northern europe early on um, scandinavia these guys will become sod busters uh, we'll have the irish and the chinese that will come for the transcontinental railroad and those two will come for these very specific jobs during the 1870s the civil war is over so the irish need something to do with themselves some way to make money and a lot of them will turn to the transcontinental railroad chinese will be brought in specifically specifically for this. Uh, Maybe they weren't even planning on coming and um, they were enticed to come to the United States to work on the Transcontinental Railroad. So many different groups of people moving out west. And what exactly is the Transcontinental Railroad? Well, it's the first railroad to go through the western part of the continent and so there are two companies in 1863 the Union Pacific and that's going to be on the eastern side and the Central Pacific on the western side and the two of these two companies will start building railroads towards one another and it is finished in 1869 which is unbelievable that it is done in six years and the place that they come together is known as Promontory Point in Utah so make sure you know Omaha Nebraska is where the Union Pacific left, Sacramento, California is where the Central Pacific left, and they meet together at Promontory Point in Utah. Yes, that will all be on the test, but I do want you to take a look at the East Coast and see how many railroads were already done. So they had to get one out west. They they need it for the mail. They need it to get more people out there to grow this brand new um, massively needed crop called wheat. And so the Union and Central Pacific are willing to work together for the economy of the entire United States, not to mention that the railroad guys are going to get really, really, really uh, rich. So let's take a look at each side. So we have the Union Pacific. Don't forget it starts in Omaha, Nebraska. And this was approved by Lincoln in 62. The guy who ends up being the main guy in charge is a man by the name of Thomas Durant. And he selects Irish people. He thinks Irish men will do the best job. Now here's the problem with Irish men. They tended to be loud and very dirty. Um, Lots of sickness among them because they didn't bathe the entire time. Uh, They demanded housing and the housing 
ends up being on a train. So I'm going to show you a dormitory here in a minute, but the, the trains themselves are turned into a house. And so how do you fit hundreds of men into this little tiny house? You do it on hammocks. So tons and tons and tons of men were basically sleeping on top of each other. Um, and then you had another car that was the eating car. Your, your biggest uh, food was boiled boiled beef and potatoes and they didn't even clean the silverware you just found an empty spot at the table um, they brought you a bowl you ate it you left your dishes there and they just filled the bowl up for the next guy and you use the same silverware so they're just filthy filthy dirty the only thing that they had to drink is beer there there were, were no water sources they had beer and so they're hungry all the time they smell horrible their portion is of the uh, trail is very 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 hot and flat and they're you know got a buzz from beer all the time but they were paid $35 a month so all in all um, it was a good monetary living for an Irish person who wasn't super welcomed in the United States um, and these guys together will end up laying over a thousand miles so you don't need to know exactly 1086 miles of track but know that they did do just over a thousand miles worth of track in the six years that they had to get this railroad finished so the Irish guys remember loud dirty swore a lot um, lots of sickness they were much more demanding than the the guys on the other railroad end that we'll talk about in a minute have a buzz all the time and they got paid 35 dollars a month for being an un unruly worker but they got a thousand miles of track laid and here's that dormitory car that I talked about. So it looks like it's it's three stories with floors in it, but it's not. It's it's three stories tall, and you could open the windows to get ventilation. But it was three stories of just hammocks. So you had to ride up, climb a ladder to get to the hammock that you were assigned to, or maybe maybe not assigned to. And um, they had like two cars worth for hundreds of guys. So you were all crammed in there like sardines. Um, and the food car, the same thing. You had to eat in shifts because it was so small but these the Irish demanded it they wanted a place to sleep that their head was covered inside of something and they wanted a place to eat a building that they could eat in and the best that the railroad guys could do is a is a train and just use the train as the building so this thing went with them as they progressed along the railroad line this dormitory car moved with them so they always had a place to sleep but imagine how gross it is I mean these guys you don't bathe the whole time you're there they're drunk and mean and nasty and uh, no no thank you no I would not want to live in a dormitory car but that's what these guys demanded and they got it and let's talk about the Central Pacific so again this one leaves from Sacramento California the main guy in charge is a man by the name of Charles Crocker so you've got Durant versus Crocker and Crocker decided that he wanted to use Chinese to build his end of the railroad and here's the difference the Chinese were very obedient they were on time they did as they were told they never fought back they were very very clean they boiled everything and they lived in tunnels that they built or tents that they brought with them so very very clean guys they kept their own animals so they didn't have to worry so much about the Central Pacific feeding them um, things that might make them sick they had their own farm animals they drank tea instead of beer and they were paid less money $30 a month and they were best the best workers so these guys had to dig 15 tunnels and they used dynamite to do it so their side of the track was much more dangerous than the Irish side uh, much harder because of the mountain ranges that they had to go through but and they are the ones that will have to use dynamite so where our Irish guys did just over a thousand miles these men will do 690 miles of track but it is a whole lot harder than the thousand miles that the other guys did so this isn't, isn't like these guys are slackers at all they were willing to do anything to get this job done now this is what they were trying to get through so again these guys are willing to use dynamite they did some crazy crazy things dynamite does not have a very long fuse so some of these men were willing to be put into these contraptions where you would light the fuse and this rubber band thing would fling your body out of the way quickly but it flung the people so quickly that it actually killed them when it flung them I mean just crazy crazy stuff and cave-ins you had to worry about cave-ins too 
So this is actually a snow tunnel that the Chinese had to build um, so that they could still keep keep laying track even though it snowed. So they would build the build the overhang and then clear the, the snow out. And again, the snow could cave in on them and they would um, lay the track um, in the snow it's just a horrible horrible job I can't even imagine it and sometimes the men did live in these snow tunnels too because there was at least a little bit of protection but then again one more time you have to worry about the cave-in so their their lives are much more fragile um, and in dire uh, dire need of safety precautions much more than the Irish guys and this is just a picture of one of the other caves that they would have been working on to um, I'm sure they blew it with with dynamite so this one isn't a winter scene but same type of thing these guys were are digging it out you blow it up with dynamite you go in you dig out the rubble and then if they had a space big enough they might use that to sleep in instead of going all the way back to their camp at night so these guys walked a long way sometimes into the tunnels to get to the next place that they were digging out and they may not be able to go back to their beds at night but the guys on the other side they are like their house follows them along the trail can't do that with these men because they're blowing mountains up and they're digging tunnels through them so they there is no train with dormitory cars they have to go back to their camp every night so their lives all in all as I said is much much more difficult than the lives of the Irish workers so their meeting point is 1869 so again they start in 63 they're done in 69 and it's promontory point utah and the golden spike so you see these two trains they actually missed each other and they had to back up and do it again so <laughs> that ending point was a little difficult to get to but they did it in promontory point and so they decided to make that last spike that they hammered in they wanted it to be golden and so they they got a gold spike and they had I think Durant was the first one to try it to try and nail it in but he was too drunk everybody that tied it that tried it was just too drunk and this little Irish guy finally came along and hammered that final spike in after you know like 15 other people had tried it but they this was a drunk mess that day but they made it and it definitely is something to celebrate that they did it so we talked about the Chinese on the railroad, but let's talk about what other alternatives they had. So they could be agricultural laborers, railroad, of course, mining, construction, but regardless of the job that they had, during the building of the railroad and after, this group of people really faced discrimination and segregation. In many cases, they'll be completely blocked from citizenship based on nothing more than the fact that they are Chinese. So it, it starts to get really, really bad around 1882. And so President Arthur decides to do something about it. And in his mind, I think that maybe he was protecting Chinese people by preventing more of them from coming here um, who knows but that's that's the way that he stated it so Arthur becomes president after Garfield is um, uh, dies from an assassination attempt so Arthur kind of steps into this he's new to it he knows that there's a problem and so he okays the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882 which says no more Chinese coming into America for 10 years and it didn't matter how valued you could be you know what you knew how to do anybody that was caught giving aid to an illegal Chinese immigrant could be fined or jailed for it I mean they were serious about this so the picture you see here at the bottom is a group of Chinese that had tried to sneak into the United States after the Chinese Exclusion Act was done in 1882 82 and this is on Angel Island so their their island to come in on the west coast is called Angel Island like the east coast has Ellis Island and here these people have been detained and they will probably be um, fined and then sent back to China anyway but they they could sit there for hours and hours and hours before somebody is gonna come and and see to them so they're not um, they're not going to be in prison but they will be detained and fined and sent home like I said so the Chinese Exclusion Act was definitely an evil thing it was only supposed to be for 10 years but when the 10 year mark came up um, it was renewed and we do not do away with the Chinese Exclusion Act completely do away with it until World War II and of course that's when we put Chinese in internment camps so we just we treat these people wonderfully we have a great history for these guys but know that it was President Arthur who did the Chinese Exclusion Act and it was supposed to be a 10-year moratorium on um, Chinese coming into the United States 
Oh, and I forgot, almost forgot. Um, if you were if you were already in the United States, you had to carry an ID saying that you uh, were here prior to 1882 and you had permission, and you had to take that ID card down to your local police department, and and so they could get a copy of your name, your address, and keep it on file in case you did anything bad. So I'm sure it was a way to pick on the Chinese immigrants as well. But these are people that were already here, and even the ones that had citizenship they were treated exactly the same so Chinese meant that you were going to be treated bad period now one of the big jobs of the Chinese outside the railroad was laundromats they they were good at laundry these are super clean people and they knew how to clean clothes and so that was a number one job for the Chinese but in 1883 some guy's gonna come up with the automatic washing machine yes I know I say that funny but that's going to be the end of a need for Chinese because now you have a machine that can do it so this cartoon was created um, as a nasty gram towards Chinese people we don't even need you for laundry anymore that's pretty derogatory now most of the people that went out west didn't know how to farm in that very different kind of soil remember the sod very different and so a lot of them many of them you could even say most of them turned to at least some type of raising cattle back then they didn't have fences and so it was called open range ranching which meant everybody's cattle basically went free and so how did you know whose cattle belonged to who well you see examples here of different ways that they um, branded their cattle and you came up with very unique ways to indicate your cattle so that nobody could reproduce that and if you were caught stealing somebody else's cattle very often it meant your life and so people didn't tend to do that very often so what do you do with all that cattle it's not like you can eat it all so the purpose of raising cattle of course is to make money and in the beginning the only place that people could figure out how to get your cattle to a shipping lane or or any kind of place to sell it would be to run it through new orleans so you have to get these cattle across the west and into new orleans and again you've got thousands of heads of cattle and not very many people to control them and so they do a lot of damage the path from the west to new orleans is filled with people um, especially new orleans so once you got there you got people that were uh, upset that the land was being destroyed their uh, lakes and ponds were being polluted from the cattle going in and using the bathroom cattle are dumb they'll walk right through your house they will follow a person like a lost little puppy and wherever that person goes they'll follow you so cattle are kind of dumb and clumsy and do a lot of damage because of it so a man by the name of Joe McCoy is going to come up with a plan to get these cattle to market and he's going to use the railroad so Joe McCoy make sure you know that now Joe came up with the idea of using something called the long drive and this basically meant that you would hire cowboys and those cowboys would be trained to guide the the heads of cattle thousands of them to the western or I'm sorry to the northern railroad so you see they're all coming out of Texas that's where all, everybody there had cattle so you head them north towards the railroad heads and at the railroad heads Joe McCoy convinced the government to allow him to build pens to put this this cattle in and so open markets started where the cattle were penned at and then towns emerged from that so let's talk about the trails first you had four major trails coming out of the south you see them here now each trail had something offer something different to offer to the guys going on the long drive and they just had to kind of decide what was best for them so the goodnight loving trail didn't have a lot of Indians on it so you didn't have to worry about that kind of danger but there is very little water and in fact there's actually a stretch of a hundred miles where there's no water at all and that that puts your your cowboys into a very very dangerous position because cattle when they smell water can kind of go crazy and we'll come back to that in a minute now look at the Chisholm Trail. The Chisholm one is the third one over. The Chisholm Trail was actually done by Indians. It was cleared by Indians who were cowboys and those Indians um, had a lot of friends along that trail and there was a lot of water. So now you've got a trail where you don't have to worry about your cattle going thirsty but if you're not an Indian and you're using that trail 
now you have to worry about the Indians. So every trail, like I said, had something different to offer. Now at the end of all these trails, regardless of the one you used, there's going to be a cow town to develop. And cow towns are not nice places. They are lawless. Um, these are the kind of places where they're waiting for these young cowboys who get paid at the end of the trip to come in to town. And they'll go and they'll they'll get a shave and, and they'll buy new clothes and they'll go over to the local saloon and get dinner and, and drinks and um, gamble and at the end of the night this guy has spent every dime that he has in every building in the town and he's upset because he has spent every dime and so very often you would find them being kicked out of town or riding out of town with their guns blazing because they were upset that all their money was gone and they got into a drunken rage just a not a nice place so of all the cow towns that that sprang up the very worst one was Dodge City so make sure that you know that when that is the worst one um, if you wanted a long life you were not going to be an inhabitant of Dodge City but again cow towns at the end of the long drive trails so let's talk about the cowboys themselves a little bit more you see some of these great pictures here uh, there's they were it was a four month trail for most of them and because you were together and it was life and death and you had to back each other up and have each other's back you became loyal to a fault to your own men so if you went into one of those cow towns and one of your guys got into a fight it's not going to be just him against whoever he got in a fight with it's going to be all the cowboys that just did that long ride with him they, they become a family entity sort of uh, like brothers backing each other up now these guys day started every day at four o'clock in the morning um, gosh you guys can barely get to school at eight can you imagine getting up at four and you you've slept on the hard ground and you have to make your make a fire to make any kind of breakfast yeah you guys wouldn't make it anyway uh, one of the most most important jobs that these guys had was ones that probably none of us would want to do when cattle start getting horns uh, it almost always becomes infected and you have to take care of it and one of the things that happens is because of their rotten stuff coming out the oozing stuff coming out around their horns and that infection they get maggots and maggots can make them sick and plus it looks gross when you get them to market who's going to buy a maggot ridden piece of meat so they had to actually physically one at a time go to each head of cattle and pick the maggots out of their horns um, again like I said these these animals are very stupid and so they will walk right into a mud hole that is deeper than them and they'll just keep on walking even if it gets tough to walk and eventually they will get stuck in the mud and the only way to do it is to get enough men to pull that sucker out and I mean you can imagine how hard it would be they're big and again you have the constant danger of stampede so um, talking about stampede remember that if they smell water they can go crazy if they've been thirsty so I found a great clip from a movie and it's got one of my favorite guys in it that's one of the reasons that I'm showing it to you really it gives me it gives me an excuse to see him um, but I'm going to show you a clip of what it's what that stampede could be like and how scary it could be so it's an Australian movie um, so I will see you after the clip and we'll talk about pockets okay so what's the deal with pockets look at the guys down there on the bottom um, two of the men at least two of them have their hands in their pockets you know why because it's a brand new idea cowboys came up with the idea of pockets because they had very limited space on their horses to carry things especially fragile things like maybe a watch that was a memento or something like that and so they came up with the idea of pockets to put more things you know be able to bring more things with them and they could keep them safe and on their person where people couldn't steal it off their horse if they went into the saloon in the cow town now cowboys are not going to last very long um, they start out just before the Civil War ends so in you know 1864 1865 is when you saw the first cowboys coming about but they were all gone by that middle of the 1870s so they last about a decade now don't forget cowboys are yes they are white men but they can also be black men there were a lot of black cowboys there were some Chinese cowboys there were a whole lot of Mexican cowboys so um, this picture isn't um, isn't super 
reminiscent of exactly all the different diversity, but know that there was diversity among the cowboys. So the farmers that are out west um, are very, very isolated and they feel like they're being picked on. They feel like they're being exploited by banks and railroads. And the more people that you get out there, the more people that are producing goods. And so, of course, their prices start to fall. Um, the things that they have, the, you know, the crops are deflating in price. So you have deflation and they are still facing high tariffs because they're stuff is harder to get to market and so farmers feel like they are being picked on in the west so they developed something called the Grange. 1860s to 1870s is the most popular year of it, but the Grange is still around today. Um, it was a farmer's organization where they they practiced cooperative buying and selling, and that way you made sure that nobody was underselling other people, and so crop prices maintained at least a reasonable rate. They even went so far as to open up banks or credit unions that were just for farmers. It was controlled by the Grange, and so you, of course you're not going to cheat a fellow farmer. Farmer. And so the men that that ran the, the bank and the men that were uh, customers of the bank were all united in this idea of let's protect the farmers and protect the money of the farmers. Um, they did have some manufactured equipment that they kept on hand for everybody to share. And so that became a cooperative that way as well. Now the Grange is not a political group, but most farmers are going to end up joining the populist party. So again, the Grange is not a political group, but if you were a farmer and you wanted to get political, you were going to join the populist party. And this is one a, a wonderful poster that was produced by the populist party because most of them are farmers and you've got the farmer in the middle and he's surrounded by people that are doing all these other great things. A teacher, a railroad guy, uh, the president of the United States, a soldier, a pastor. The, and no matter what, no matter who you are, how great you are, how great you aren't, I'm feeding you because I'm a farmer. And so that was a great, great propaganda poster to remind people how important farmers were. And don't forget, that was done by the Populist Party for the members of the Grange. But the Grange is not a political party. We've talked about the West and the whites and the immigrants um, that went into the West. We talked about um, freedmen going into the West, but we haven't talked a lot about the people that were already there, the Native Americans. And so by 1890, here is a, a picture of the reservations that existed in the Western part of the United States. And pretty much any, any Indian that was left in the United States was put on one, in one of these reservations. So most of them are around by 1860 this was a much better map so I chose to show you one that was in the 1890s it didn't change a whole lot those reservations for the most part are still there some are a little bit bigger some are a little bit smaller but this kind of gives you a good idea think of th think of the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that that existed here as Native Americans when whites arrived and started taking their land and by 1890 you're down to this these little blue spots so they didn't do, they didn't go quietly they fought to keep what was theirs and that's the next section of this unit what happened to those Native Americans so let's start in the 1860s the goal was to put the Plain Indians on reservations because the railroad is coming through you've got more and more whites that are traveling out west uh, wanting land now you have freedmen coming out west wanting land especially in places like Kansas and so you are going to have this huge push to get those Indians out of the way and onto a reservation and this is going to develop into something called the Great Sioux War now this takes place because of the northern Pacific Railroad and the Indian Revolt is is a combined effort between Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull. So you see the difference right here. Sitting Bull is a Lakota Sioux. So he is a Sioux but he's a different type. Lakota Sioux. He's a chief and he's a mystic. He's not a warrior at all. So very different from the guy you see over here on the other side, Crazy Horse. He was an Agalala Sioux chief, and he was a great warrior. So these two guys are going to get together and, and really try and hold their ground and keep their people's land for them. 
The most well-known battle of the Great Sioux War was the Battle of Little Bighorn. So don't forget, you've got Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull that is encouraging their people to fight back, to not be part of, of the reservations. There were three major reservations that the government was trying to shove all these people, um, especially the Sioux, onto. And these two men, are, are their people are hiding out, and they're not going to do it. So... Of course, they're, they are enemies of the government because of that, and there are soldiers that are sent out west to look for Sioux Indians and other Indians that weren't going willingly to the reservations, and it just so happens that at a place called Little Bighorn, a military guy by the name of Custer discovers that there is a, a large band of Sioux Indians that are not on a reservation and for whatever reason this man decides that he is going to take them on and so Custer's men and Custer himself are all killed that day all of them now the, the problem with the battle of Little Bighorn is that the men of the tribe were actually out hunting and so Custer is starting starting to attack and it's women and children and the warriors come back and see what is happening to their families and they just like go after Custer and his men of course they're going to they're protecting their women and their children and they annihilate Custer so it is the last real Indian victory for the um for anybody out west but especially for the Sioux now in the aftermath of it Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull realize that they're going to have to get up, give up, and they're going to have to go to a reservation or run. And so they each make a different decision. Crazy Horse says he's going to stay stay behind. He is going to go to a reservation, and but he's going to try to continue that resistance secretly. They're scared now because they've killed Custer and all of his men. And so Crazy Horse feels like in order to save his people, he has to pretend that he's giving up. And so he goes to the reservation. Now, on the reservation, his wife, who he loved dearly, got sick. And so he decides that um, he's going to go get help. He really wants to go get her mother, who is not on the reservation. She's on a different reservation. And um, when he gets to the mother, he's going to get medical help as well. But mom was like a medicine woman. So Crazy Horse really felt like he needed to go get her. And, of course, he is told he cannot leave the reservation. And so he says, I, I'm going to leave anyway. My wife is my wife is sick. I've got to go get her help. And they arrest him and lock him up. So he's on the reservation, worried about his sick wife, trying to get out to get her medicine. And somebody, one of the soldiers, shows up at the door and says, you know, the guy in charge wants to talk to you. And so he, he leaves the building. He thinks he's being taken to the boss. And somebody walks right up to him and runs a sword right through him. So he never made it to get help for his wife. He died right there in the street. And his wife ended up dying as well. She was really that sick. So Crazy Horse has a horrific end. Now Sitting Bull decided to run. He decided that he, he wanted to leave the country and hide out in Canada. And he stays there until 1881. And when he comes back, he is arrested for a few years, stays in, stays in jail for a few years. And then he ends up, this is so weird, he ends up joining a Wild West show, the Buffalo Bill Cody Wild West show. And he becomes a a pretty big star but um, part of the show and part of the reason that he did it was he wanted to make well known the idea of the Sioux ghost dance and the ghost dance was is this dance and I'm going to show you a picture or a, a film clip of it in a minute this ghost dance is supposed to bring all the dead ancestors of Indians back to life and their spirits and or I don't know if you want to call them zombies or whatever are supposed to help the the living Indians defeat the whites and so he would perform this ghost dance and tell what it was supposed to mean and it scared the crap out of white people but he he wanted it to he wanted them to think that he could actually do this and scare them and maybe get rights back for his people but it got scary enough that they finally arrested him for doing the ghost dance. They had been telling him not to do it, and he kept doing it. And so he is arrested. Um, when he's arrested, supposedly there was a scuffle, and he was accidentally shot. But he was killed for the ghost dance in 1890.
Crazy Horse is dead and now Sitting Bull is dead and so the remnants of both those tribes and I say remnants because the numbers had been dwindled greatly through hunger, um, massacre, um, but they're they're struggling and so these two groups both being Sioux decide that they're going to get together and they're going to head towards a larger reservation where they're hoping there's going to be more food and better housing and so of course on the way they have women and children with them so on the way they stop often to kind of gather their strength and rest for the night and there is a military group that comes upon them and stops them and said and it's at the place called wounded knee this is a location so in 1890 they stop them and they basically put them under arrest and they tell them that none of them are allowed to have weapons and you know we're just going to try and figure out what to do with you people so no weapons we're going to come in and take them and then we're just going to try and figure out what to do with you and when they went in to take the guns there was a uh, deaf Indian by the name of Black Coyote and Black Coyote according to witnesses did not understand why they were taking his gun. He kept saying he had paid a lot for it and nobody was taking his gun. And so Black Coyote is struggling and the gun goes off. Well, at the same time that Black Black Coyote is struggling and the gun goes off, there is another member of the Sioux tribe that is leading a ghost dance group. And I think that the soldiers just got freaked out. Here's an Indian, a gun has gone off, he's fighting, he's arguing, there's another group of them doing a ghost dance and they just started firing so they they did it in fear I think to start with but then they didn't know how to stop and in the end over 300 of the Sioux will be killed that day um, that would be bad enough but a lot of them were actually butchered you had a lot of cases where women were grabbing their children and running for safety and they shot the woman in the back um, and then went and killed the baby on purpose when the, when the chaos had kind of quieted down, they one of the guys uh, on the white side went out into the middle of the camp and yelled, you know, to some of the children that were scared, come on out and we will we'll protect you. And these little children appeared and they shot them. So it was a bloody, bloody massacre. Um, believe it or not, there were some soldiers that got awards for this. Um, the government remove them down through the line in history but the the deed was done 300 of them were dead shortly after this took place there was a giant blizzard the ground was frozen and they couldn't even bury them um, properly and so I'm going to show you a picture of what they ended up doing with them so here's a picture of the mass grave that that they had dug for um, all of them and and that's the way it went you see the soldiers there all gathered and the bodies were frozen and stuck to the ground and they had to pry them up and sho shove them in basically a trench and so a very very sad end to a very very proud people um, the Sioux people Now the Sioux were not the only ones that were fighting back. There was another group called the Nez Perce, which means pierced nose. And they were led by a guy by the name of Chief jo Joseph. And he refused to go live on a reservation. And he led his people on a 1400 mile march towards Canada evading military for months and months and months on um, the mil our military the white military referred to him as the red napoleon and said that they had never met a man as brave or valiant as this guy but when he surrendered in 1877 they couldn't allow him to not be punished and so his tribe is sent to idaho without him in 1877 and now you remember the Compromise of 1877 allowed Rutherford B. Hayes to become president. And when he became president and, and was actually sworn in, Chief Joseph went to him and said, look, I've been, they've been forcing me to stay here in, in D.C. I want to go be with my family in Idaho. Please let me go. And Rutherford B. Hayes said no. And they really kind of used Chief Joseph as um, an oddity at, at get-togethers. He wasn't really under arrest arrest, but he kind of was. It was like house arrest type of thing. And um, he ends up never being allowed to go be with his family again. So he finally dies in 1904 for no cause whatsoever they could find no reason that this man should have died and so the doctor actually gave the cause of death as a broken heart because he had been kept separated from his family and his tribe for so long so there's another evil thing that Rutherford B. Hayes did 
for many, many, many years, the whites have been trying to civilize, and you can't see me, but I'm putting that in, in qu quotes, um, trying to civilize Indians. And in 1887, Grover Cleveland decided that he was going to do something to make them completely self-sufficient, property conscious, which is the white way, you know, land means power, profit oriented, basically make them completely white and they used an idea from a guy by the name of Dawes and Richard Dawes and he was from Massachusetts and he came up with the idea of the Dawes Severalty Act in 1887 and remember now these Indians have been forced onto a reservation and by this time period they lived in white housing their children had Christian names they were dressing like white people they were they, a lot of them had lost their native tongue so they're they're trying their hardest to be white and this is that last last thing that makes them white so on a reservation they were still living as a community living together sharing things and Grover Cleveland said no more you're not doing that so they went in and they took basically they took attendance and they looked at uh, what families existed and instead of allowing them to live as a live as a community families were separated by 160 acres so each family got 160 acres they had to build their own house they had to grow their own crops completely separating them from the rest of the tribe and of course any surplus land that was open in the reservations once they assigned the 160 acres to these individual families the surplus was open to white buyers which really meant spies so these white people were allowed to come into Indian territory and spy on the Indians of course they exploited them the Indians were afraid of them so whatever they wanted they basically got for free and anything that Indians did that you know they considered wrong they could report it back to the government and punish these people so the Dahl Severalty Act did a lot of damage to the Indian tribes because it separated them and all Indian tribes were communal all of them were they shared everything from you know raising children to building houses to growing crops all together and so now for the first time ever they're not allowed to do that it's actually illegal because of the Dawes Severalty Act so we focused on children in America um, the children were the ones that we attempted to civilize more than the adults and so it was it was assumed that the generation of adults that existed in the 1870s 60s and 70s were as civilized as we could possi possibly get them and so we're gonna have to go after the children because if you start them off young maybe they'll be better whites and so Indian agents, there's always been Indian agents since since the beginning of us starting to push these poor natives out of their own homeland. There's been Indian agents and these would be people that are a liaison between the tribe and the government. And often the Indian agents lived in among the Indians and kind of bossed them around. And these Indian agents would go in and find kids that they felt need to be civilized and rehabilitated and take them away they actually took them away from their families and they lived in sort of these orphanages they weren't orphans but they were treated as such and on the, in a lot of the places the parents were not allowed to visit the children and so the kids will be educated to be as white as possible and the men are going to be trained to be farmers so and that actually is against a lot of the belief systems of these Plains Indians that they didn't believe that you should turn the earth that that was you know God would the gods would provide whatever was necessary and that mostly meant buffalo and things that grew wild but now all of a sudden you're telling them they have to be farmers they have to turn the soil and so assimilating the Indians became the thing of the day and so I'm going to let you watch a video clip here of what it was like to be a child in one of these schools being uh, assimilated and civilized and re-educated. There was a huge impact on the Indians because of the Dawes Severalty Act and just living on the reservations period but they don't have a full preservation of their past it's only partial and for some of the tribes 
it's pretty much nothing. Um, of all the tribes I've visited, the Chickasaw have held on to theirs the hardest and the longest. They even still speak their native tongue, but most tribes don't. And so they um, have lost their past. On the reservations in present times, even today, there's a very low quality of life on the reservations. I'm going to show you some pictures here of what it's like in modern days. We basically put these people in areas that no white person would want to live for good reason. So you see behind them, isn't it lovely? Um, surely they can draw, they can uh, grow great crops. We force them to be farmers, but what, what are you going to grow out there? And this is modern times. I think this might be Arizona, one of them in Arizona. Just lovely, clean, mm -hmm. great place to live. Now my husband and I traveling through Hopi territory in Arizona came across this beautiful, beautiful building. Again, Hopi, H-O-P-I. And it was in the middle of the night in a huge, huge rainstorm and we couldn't see the road anymore and so we saw these lights and we pulled over and we went into this hotel one of the most beautiful hotels i've ever been into and the lady says i'm sorry we only have one room left and it's for people with disabilities and we said well we don't care you know what, what's there going to be a bar in the shower we don't care and so they said okay if you're okay with it and it was pretty cheap too so we go up to this room and I kid you not, it was the biggest hotel room I have ever seen. It was like it was like an apartment. And it was just bigger so that somebody with a wheelchair could get around. I mean, it was gorgeous. And they are, they apologized the entire time for giving us this hotel. So or the that room. Best hotel stay ever. And they treated us like we were, you know, kings and queens. It was wonderful. So here's some pictures of what it looked like inside. Um, they had a lake outside, beautiful, beautiful pools. Um, but here's the thing. It looks gorgeous, right? Well, the next day after the giant rainstorm, we went outside and they it's nothing but red clay there. And it had flooded. And so there was red clay in everything. The pool that you see here, you couldn't even tell it was a pool. It was nothing but red clay. And so there's these people frantically, Hopi people, frantically cleaning everything out and sweeping everything off. And my husband and I went through, um, I went for a run and, and he, he went for a walk, you know, because he's not as athletic as me. But uh, we came back and we're telling each other what we saw and basically the town was decimated you know the sidewalks were, were raised up and cracked and and there were wild dogs everywhere and trash and dog poo and I mean I think that's the normal way it is anyway but now they have all this extra damage so I said to the hotel people you know gosh this is horrible how often does this does this happen and and they're like four or five times a year that this happens and they have to rebuild that so you know but I can't believe they treat white people so nicely, but the guy said, you know, you're you're our customers. We have to be nice to you. So our hotel, you're going to live in the lap of luxury, but if you walk across the street and actually go into the town, the Hopi town, you're going to see what life is like for us. And let me tell you, it was it was not good. It was unclean and unsafe and just a disaster. And this is this is their life. This is what we've done to them by putting them on these reservations. And here is just another picture of a uh, another Hopi village. And you can see how cramped it is. Um, the larger building that you see over on the left-hand side, the brick building, that's their school. And there's actually c uh, ceiling tiles that are falling down. And we looked in the windows. You know I'm nosy. Um, it, it's just, it's a mess. And there was a little boy that was driving a truck, a little boy driving a truck. He's probably like 12. And he was going from house to house and another kid would jump out of the back of the truck and go knock on doors and then somebody would run out of the house they were picking people up is what they were doing to go stand on the street corner in the bigger town next next to them looking for so they could look for work and they would stand on the street corner all day and hope that somebody would come pick them up take them to their farm or their factory or whatever give them a job for the day and then bring them back little kids are doing this little kids um, and again that's part of the Hopi reservation so very sad so that that's the end of West stuff and uh, now we're going to take a completely different turn and look at industry and labor so we've got the Western people let's look what's happening in the big city for people that live there.